Again, my name is Dr. Shane Dixon. Thank you for the introduction, Nora. I just wanted to explain a little bit. I am a professor at Arizona State University. Uh, I work in the department uh, uh, called Global Launch. And yes, my colleague, uh, Justin Schul, and I have developed um, a TESOL certificate program that's gone viral. It's kind of crazy. I never thought I'd do anything that went viral, so to speak. And that's kind of a fun thing to be able to say. There's 150,000 learners. They're all teachers. They're trying to become better English language teachers, professionals from all over the world. And we have been able to uh, train teachers now from over 206 different countries. And so that's a very, very exciting kind of opportunity that we've been a part of. I used to have to take my gig on the road, so to speak. And so I've been able to go to a number of different countries doing teacher training um, for a lot of university professors, for example, or a lot of public school teachers from Peru and Mexico. And, and I think uh, she spoke of some of the things that we were able to do. It's very exciting to be able to do that, um, although the chance to be able to kind of compile all that information into a way that now we can disseminate it in an online language learning platform has been kind of amazing to me. And it, it allowed me to see, um, perhaps in a small sense, the opportunities that are in front of us. And that's a little bit what I wanted to talk about today is some of those future trends of, of language learning and, of course, uh, how maybe online language learning and technology in general in the classroom fit into that. Hey, Mike. Hello. <laughs> so this is a small... Uh, Small gathering, I'm really glad for that. Um, there's quite a number of people that I know, um, but hopefully I'll be able to speak on some things that you do not know, or that will at least stir the embers of the fires of your brain. One of the reasons you come to a conference, right, is to be re-energized, renewed, to get some ideas that maybe uh, you can take home with you, uh, set you on a path that maybe you had not considered before. So that's uh, some of what I want to do. When I do teacher training for uh, university professors in particular, a, a weird thing happens. Um, Ken Robinson uh, talks about academics as, uh, as misunderstanding the importance of uh, teaching in general and uh, what it can do for learners. He talks about how academics tend to think of bodies as only transports for their brains. Have you ever kind of understood that kind of a professor who just likes to give content rather than recognizing that maybe your body can be used in a way to engage a learner uh, in terms of your hands, in terms of your eye contact. Whoa, I have a body. I didn't, I didn't realize that. So when I do a lot of training for university professors, one of the first things I do is I have them reflect on the resources they have right here. And that could be a kind of a revolutionary thought for them. They haven't really considered their body as an instrument or a technique for instruction. Um, and so many of the techniques that we mention in Teach English Now, the, the TESOL certificate program, is to help you to learn how to engage a learner with your eyes, with your hands, with your voice, and that those are powerful instruments for, uh, for learning and for engagement in general. So one of my mantras is to go where the fires are, so to speak. Uh, in other words, uh, I'm, I'm a card-carrying member of the dissatisfied. Let's put it that way. Um, meaning that I like to uh, find a higher purpose and find those places that maybe aren't doing so well. And that is one of the reasons I decided to get uh, a PhD in educational technology, because I thought it was pretty horrible. <laughs> to be quite honest, I thought that most online learning platforms were pretty poor in their strategy, in their technique, and once again, all I saw was that talking head, that professor that's like just giving out content. It's like, well, that's boring. And it's not engaging, and it often wasn't relevant to the learners themselves. So I was talking to uh, some of the participants earlier where you get a master's in TESOL, and you immediately enter the workforce, and you get your first job, and you're like, well, that didn't help at all. That's kind of one of the things that happens. There's sort of a disconnect in terms of um, what we're learning in academia and how it translates in real life. So anyway, as a card-carrying member of the dissatisfied, I, 
I got my PhD in educational technology, started looking for some of those things where I could make a difference. And you're probably, if not exactly like me, most ESL professionals or EFL professionals, um, you didn't do it for the money. Am I right? Because if you did, you're terrible at math. That's just, I don't know what to say to you at that point. So there's obviously some kind of higher purpose, something you want to do, something you want to accomplish, some sort of impact that you want to have on people. And it is my opinion that trends, and sometimes these larger global trends, were so entrenched in our little tiny, um, well, classrooms, or sometimes just at our desks, doing lesson plans or whatever it is, that we fail to see some of those global trends until they're kind of upon us, and we recognize, and I think some of the older teachers can, can feel this, because there's been several times where suddenly you're like, I think teaching just passed me by. I better update myself, or I need to improve in some ways. So what I wanted to do today was just kind of go through some of the trends that I see in education, especially online and technology, uh, and see how that might influence you. And you might be thinking, well, it doesn't, but it will. And many of these changes are incremental. 2% change a year means a huge change over time. Right? So as these online learning platforms get larger, as technologies continue to improve, you may find yourself, strangely, like two of my sister-in-laws are suddenly teaching for VIP kids, teaching Chinese children in the morning. And they're watching my videos to learn how to become English teachers. And I'm like, this is really weird. These are my sister-in-laws that know nothing about the TESOL world suddenly thrown into it. And so something's happening here, something unusual. All right, so. Let's go ahead and begin. I want to make this as awkward as possible. Let's go ahead and talk about politics. Let's just begin that. Let's go ahead and begin right there. So, um, yes. Um, I like this picture. These, uh, I like the fact that one person looks quite disgusted at whatever comment was made, and another one just staring with disbelief. Um, you may have noticed in today's world there's a little bit of incivility in social media. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's noticed that or not. Uh, in terms of the fact that we're constantly talking about each other, we're constantly at each other's throat, and things are just terrible. Terrible. Everything's terrible these days. And um, one of the things here, I'll, I'll illustrate this with yet another, I need to know where to point. Um, another brief slide here. Um, outcomes of political arguments on Facebook. I like this slide in particular. I think it it's reasonably explains my point. <laughs> You'll notice the green represents all the times your mind is changed. And then, of course, the blue represents all of the time that they change their mind through your efforts at political discussion. Then, of course, there's the final where... No one changes anything in everyone's. Yeah. So. Now, when you look at trends, and one of the things I like to do is look at larger global trends, larger data sets, and they're quite readily available um, now, is I like to see if the anger that we're all having collectively is warranted. We're so upset so much of the time. And I wanted, just for a brief moment, to give you some good news. And I wanted to share with you uh, some of the data that is useful not only in our field, but maybe on a larger global scale. Uh, one of the reasons I do this, and the thesis with which I approach today's lecture, is that um, when you know the trends, you can make yourself useful to those trends. And you can adapt to those trends. And 2% at a time, many times trends, especially positive trends, go unnoticed. And so it's really important that you start paying attention to the positive stuff rather than that negative stuff that we're hearing all of the time. And when you notice those things that go unnoticed, you will become a better teacher. So 
Steven Pinker, uh, professor of, at Harvard University, uh, classical uh, humanist, suggests that we need to know the data, and we need to know the data in aggregate form. Hans Rosling, a uh, Swedish economist, among other things, says it this way, let my data set change your mindset. Let my data set change your mindset. Are things getting progressively worse? Is the end of the world imminent? Well, perhaps when we have these tirades and all of these messages sent to us, let me share one more. Um, it's very interesting. If, if we extended this graph to 2018, it would plummet even further. Uh, but you can see that the tenor and the tone of the news is so entirely negative. That's a fascinating thing to have the tenor of the news be so negative all of the time. And of course, we collectively think that the world has never been worse. We've never been more divided. Things are just so awful. But I want to show, at least in some uh, measures, that we're doing quite well on a global scale. And language learning has never been more robust than it has been. And there are opportunities that will present themselves and ways in which you'll need to update as a result. So yes, tone of the news, it's not good. I don't know how many of you are just like, never mind, I'm just turning it all off. I'm goodbye social media, good. I, I'm hearing more and more of these fasts, these cleansings. I just can't be in that world anymore. It's just too negative. All right, so is the world getting worse? Steven Pinker's data, again, if you would uh, be more interested in this on a larger scale, I recommend his text. It's called Enlightenment Now, uh, or Our Better Angels, a, a book that he did previously. Um, if I told you, if or I just asked you, and you're looking at this slide here, so this may uh, kind of give things away. If I told you, is hunger getting worse in the world? Is poverty getting worse in the world? Extreme poverty, is it getting worse or better? You might be surprised to know, maybe you're not, that about 80% will say, yes, it's absolutely getting worse. Things are getting worse. Inequality is getting worse. Uh, wealth is getting worse. Income is getting worse. Uh, measures of safety are getting worse. Things are getting worse. But what we're noticing in the actual data is that things are getting a lot better. <laughs> so this is quite quite an optimistic thing, but it's almost entirely unreported. Let me give you an example of this. World hunger has halved in the last 30 years. World hunger has halved in the last 30 years. That's rather remarkable. Maybe for some of you, we have some academics here, that's not remarkable, you knew that. But for the great majority of people out there, if you ask how's world hunger doing, there's a belief that has gotten tremendously worse. And in fact, there are several councils that have suggested that by 2030, we could eradicate it completely. And while that sounds probably for most economists and th those in the know that that's probably a bold prediction, the fact that we can even make it one is remarkable. It's remarkable. So, how about um, poverty? Better or worse? Here's famine, by the way. Poverty, extreme poverty. What we have noticed is that extreme poverty, I'll say it uh, precisely, uh, using Max Roser uh, as, uh, as the primary uh, researcher here. He once quipped that if the news cycle reported world extreme poverty, it would read like this. The number of people in extreme poverty fell by 137,000 yesterday. So the number of people in extreme poverty fell by 137,000 yesterday. Oh, and by the way, yesterday and every day for the last 25 years. What? <laughs> Why isn't it newsworthy? Why isn't it getting attention? Now, some of you can probably already guess some of the reasons that we're not paying attention to it. One of the reasons is that it's big data. 
And it's so constant and it's so incremental that nobody pays attention to these amazing increases. That's fascinating, 137,000, no longer in abject poverty any longer, and the trend is continuing. Now, there are other reasons for this. Um, if you were to have a news cycle that publishes every day, you don't report on the country that's been at peace for 40 years, do you? You report on the country that there's some kind of conflict, something happened, something bad. And so obviously the news media feeds this cycle of negativity. And so we fail to see longer term trends because of that negative cycle. It's really interesting. It's kind of this prisoner of the moment, so to speak, kind of thinking. Now that doesn't mean that nothing's bad, that everything's going well, but on almost every major uh, measure of human life, uh, safety, crime, terrorism, inequality, justice, uh, fairness, equity, there are major improvements that are going unnoticed. And you should know them. The data set can help change your mindset and maybe help you sleep a little bit better at night. So one of the reasons for this, again, maybe, I don't know how many of you have heard of Norman Borlaug. We don't have Borlaug Elementary School. It's very strange. Okay, we got one. Fantastic, an agronomist. <laughs> Who knows about agronomists? Did you know that Norman Borlaug, by conservative estimates, has saved over a billion lives? There's, there's no elementary school named after him. He saved over a billion lives. It's called the Green Revolution. Oh, okay, I've heard of the Green Revolution. That's right, there have been these amazing advances in agriculture that have estimated to save about a billion people. Uh, anybody ha heard of Carl Landsteiner? Carl Landsteiner. His discovery of the fact that there are different blood types has also been estimated to have saved about a billion lives because of tra blood transfusions and things of that nature. Why aren't those reportable facts? Again, we don't report big data trends. And one of the reasons we don't is because they're not incidences, they're non-incidents. So we don't know about them, we don't think about them, we don't study them, we don't make elementary schools named after them. But Borlaug has saved a billion people. That's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. So, now, let's talk a little bit about the field that we're in. Ah, oh, finally something negative. Ah, that'll make you feel a little bit better. Look at that. There's a trend, and we know this trend. Things have gone down the last couple of years. The IEPs, and, and here in the United States, people are not coming to programs anymore, and there's more fear, and there's more this, and there's more that, and ah, okay, so finally, yes, you can be comforted. <laughs> Some people enjoy bad news, too. It makes them feel safe, because <laughs> it's the way in which they approach the world, right? That, that, that it speaks to their worldview in whatever way. All right, but unfortunately, I have more good news, even though there has been uh, a decrease in the percentage, the overall numbers are still quite positive. Unfortunately, there's more international students here in the United States than ever. I apologize for those of you that were feeling like things are just really bad. Things have continued to improve, and there's a slight bump this year in particular. And so we're expecting to see even stronger numbers from IIE, who does these studies, Open Doors does these studies. So here's some more global trends to look at. International students are still coming and they still want to come, and they're enjoying the experience. So good job to you. Good job to you. All right. Now, here's something that has to do with the global language services industry of which English is a mammoth. English represents more than half of all language learning industry um, amount or money, so to speak. So you can see the trend continues to improve. That's good news for you. That's good news for people who want to stay in this industry and find it be successful in your life. All right, you'll notice here, lots of people are talking about a revolution in the digital world. I talk about it quite some time in, the, in this idea that 
online education is going to take over, and so you're no longer going to have a job. Students aren't going to come here to the United States. I've certainly heard this more than one time. The truth is, and if you look at this very large pie, the digital English language learning is mammoth. It's $1.8 billion. But your job is pretty safe. If you look at that yellow section there, I know it's a little fuzzy. It's offline English language learning is still 33.7 billion. You guys are large. And I don't know where all that money's going. I'm sorry it's not going to your pockets. But it exists out there and you're doing well as an industry. Okay? Now, the digital English language learning program is growing. And that's true too. It's becoming massive. And we look at compound annual growth rates. It's pretty impressive. So, I'm sorry, this is a little small here. In 2016-17, there was an increase of 3.4% over the prior year in terms of the number of international students. These are just kind of bullet points of the last slide. You'll notice also global e-learning market is going to expand to 275 billion with a compound annual growth rate of 7.5%. Pretty impressive. Um, has anybody heard that China is just exploding? Has anybody heard that? It's true, but when we say just exploding, what do we mean by that? We hear these terms and we fail to put them in proper perspective because we don't see what the actual numbers are. It is growing by 10.7% uh, compounded by a year. Remember, like I said, 2% compounded over time can make a huge difference. So the fact that it is growing and compound growth is pretty impressive, pretty impressive. But you'll notice global di digital English language has the most math massive growth right there. It's a CAGR, a compound annual growth rate of 22.38%. For those of you that know numbers or statistics at all, you should be awing right now. <laughs> You'd be like, whoa, that's a big deal. <laughs> right? So for someone like me who likes to enjoy the data sets, that makes me go, oh, that's where I need to go. That's why I got an educational, a PhD in educational technology, because that's the growth area. Because English, right now, we have talking heads online. It's no good. It can be better than that. And it should be better than that. And there's opportunities in the trends. There's opportunities in the trends. OK, so now we're going to spend just a little bit of time here. Uh, to talk about those opportunities. Um, the first, I'm going to ask uh, four or five questions here. I'm going to, we're ESL professionals, and one of the things that you always do is you demand that your students form awkward conversation partners. How dare you? <laughs> and I'm going to do the same thing. <laughs> Absolutely. How have you had to adapt to technology in the classroom? I'm going to give you about a minute to go ahead and discuss with the partner. What have you had to do to adapt to the ever-changing presence of technology in the classroom? If you are a classroom teacher, if not, as a student or as an administrator, what have you seen? So go ahead and talk for about a minute. Okay, guys. So we don't have time to get into some of the discussion that you've had. But uh, let's go ahead and see if some of the discussion revolved around these kinds of topics. Um, it's fascinating. Sometimes it's just the media that you have to use in the classroom has changed. Or the amount has changed. My goodness, all of my classes now are on Blackboard or on Canvas or, or of that nature. I used to have like a boombox, and then I had a CD player, and then I had a flash drive, and then I had um, yeah, and now a teacher just yesterday told me, you know, flash drives are just so antiquated. And I was like, oh, <laughs> already? Because now what, one of the things that's happened is we've gone into uh, an archival format. You go to a website and you download an MP3 or something of that nature. You house everything online. So everything is in an online format, right? So the Google Drive has taken over or Dropbox or other kinds of things. For, for universities, or you go to like an online book website or something of that nature. Um, of course, <sighs> students are getting very familiar with online avenues for engaging in English. And so now it seems like every teacher has to be a TED Talk teacher, right? 
hello everybody, let me, right, you have that sense of presentation skills that maybe weren't nearly as necessary before. Students go outside the classroom and watch TED Talks. You have to, you may have noticed that students are a little addicted to cell phones. I don't know, if you're in elementary school, pray that you don't have to witness this, but now you have to compete with cell phones. And I hate to break it to you, but cell phones are way more interesting than you are. And I haven't even met you, that's pretty rude, <laughs> right? Like we're competing with something that's so difficult. And so our, our presentation skills have to be sharper as a necessity to just compete with this guy. That's a fascinating change. And it's kind of come upon us. It's not really reported, it's just a truth that you are living right now. So you have to adapt, right? All right. Other ways, I mentioned this before, now you administer a lot of classroom instruction. There's a blended format that's almost like common now. About five to ten years ago, we were always talking about the blended classroom. What is the blended flip the curriculum? Now it's just something you do naturally. Here's an assignment, here's a thing, we're going to talk about it tomorrow. It's a very natural part of the way many teachers do things now. And you're always sending them out into the universe, even into the online world, into the resources that are now vast. Uh, English language resources particularly are vast. And now you have to curate them, which means you have to, that's good, that's bad, oh, this is really cool. And you have to talk with each other even more. I found a cool TED talk, this works really well. Or I found this resource for, for kids and I used it in my class, it was amazing. And you have to find, and we're all looking for each other and making friends with people in Connecticut or Jordan or wherever, right? It's a fascinating thing that's happened, right? Is the globalization or the democratization of teaching. It pre presents certain challenges, of course, but it presents certain opportunities as well. Here's a second question. We won't have time to go uh, to have you break up in awkward groups uh, again, but let's go ahead and just have you think about this. Why is self-directed learning such a crucial feature of future learners? And let me just go through that really quickly myself. Um, because global e-learning has expanded so rapidly, and we're seeing that 7.5%, I know for many of you that means nothing. But I just want you to remember this, this phrase of mine, 2% every year, means sooner or later there's a huge change. And you may be seeing a whole different world, right? So 7.5% change or growth means something. So what does it mean? Well, millions of learners are added to massive open online courses each year, right? And many of you will be teaching, oh, I hate to think of this, but many of those first year master's students that just graduate, they're gonna be teaching on VIP kids, they're gonna be teaching iTutor, they're going to be working two or three jobs at the community college, and it's gonna be rough. And that is one of the realities of uh, this new trend. Governments are beginning to purchase online course solutions, often with terrible results. I have worked, uh, uh, with ministries of education in Peru, Mexico, and I'll be going a couple weeks to Paraguay as a language planning and policy expert. And they'll say, what should we do? And I say, well, you need to have a multi-tiered strategy where you have lots of resources and lots of this, and you need to train teachers and all kinds of techniques, and you need to do self-directed learning. And they just, it's too confusing for them. So what do they do? They buy an online language service program and call it good. That's what they do, and it's usually terrible. We're gonna have all of our teachers, all of our students be fluent by 2020. That was the Peruvian language planning uh, policy and the plan that they put in place. And what did they do? They bought a bunch of laptops. What are the laptops doing? Gathering dust. And I told them not to do it. I begged them not to do it, and they did it. So these are some of the trends that we're seeing. And I have to learn how to speak louder so that they stop it. All right, can people learn a language in their own country better than ever before? I am going to spend one minute, language partners, chat it up. Of course, I am an advocate for online language learning in general, um, but I wanted to share a story with you. Uh, I was doing a teacher training um, with a group of Mexican teachers from, uh, from all over Mexico. They came to ASU and 
we gave them a, a three or four week training. And I get in lines and I just asked uh, names of the participants, of all the teachers, and I asked them one question. Uh, it's always the same question. I've been doing this for the last 10 years. How did you learn English? That's the question that I asked. How did you learn English? And it's fascinating. Some of them, of course, they spent a year in the United States or, or, or they went to another English-speaking country, but many of them did not. And that's what's fascinating to me. I was like, wait, so you learned English having never gone. And I thought about it, and I was like, that's so crazy. And I was like, oh, wait, that's how I learned Portuguese. I never learned, I've never been to Brazil. I've never been to Portugal. How the heck? Well, I had a Brazilian girlfriend. That helped. She refused to learn English. That helped too. Like, that was weird. And I started recognizing there were resources, and somehow I had embedded myself in an environment that was immersive. But it wasn't immersive in the classical sense. And so here's what I wrote down in one of the conversations with the Mexican teachers. I asked this question, how did you learn English? And an older teacher says, I watch Friends. Her companion says, friends? You watch your friends? No, it's a TV show, tonta. Just like your Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones? I love Game of Thrones. Nah, I don't watch Game of Thrones. I watch YouTube videos. Now, I read New York Times online. I play games online with English-speaking friends, like Fortnite. I listen to podcasts. Podcasts? No one listens to podcasts. You, you're a nerd. I love the Lakers. I watch all their games. So I wrote that down, because I was like, this is too good. This little conversation of people that had surrounded themselves. Immersion is no longer about location. Or at 2% every year, it's becoming less and less about location. Does that make sense? So maybe not yet, maybe not in your place, maybe not in your country, but slowly, things are changing. What immersion is becoming is something entirely different. It's becoming community, online resources, goals, textbooks, online, and I could add to this list about 30 or 40 things. And so when I do language planning and policy and talk to ministries of education, I say, this is how you do it. This is how languages are actually being learned. This is what's happening in the world now. <laughs> So, how do you upgrade your teaching? Very quickly, because people are learning on their own more than ever before, our roles as teachers are changing slightly. And you may want to consider learning how to learn, the techniques by which you can help students to gain better results on their own. Now, I'm not suggesting that you're not important as a teacher, but you're maybe not so important as you used to be. You are not the central figure where they're getting all of their English instruction. And you don't want to be the central figure where they're getting all of their instruction. They will learn much more, more if they have an immersive experience, right? So I don't have a lot of time to speak about those particular topics, but I do have a book. <laughs> it's called Learning How to Learn a Language. It will be out in January. I believe, and we will teach some of the basic principles on how to learn a language and how to engage learners in what we call a language ecosystem. So how do you help students engage in an online world? You have to help them to have activities outside of the classroom, no doubt. You're going to have to have them understand self-directed learning principles. There's so much stuff out there, they need to learn how to navigate that stuff better. You need to learn how to navigate that stuff better. Does anybody here try to learn a language lately? And your lesson plans focus on sending students to the outside world more and more often. In other words, and here's the term that I've used, the language ecosystem. The English ecosystem describes a holistic environment that encourages and extends the learning and application of the English language beyond the classroom through a diverse system of activities and incentives. In other words, language learning happens outside the classroom doors. Again, I'm not emphasizing that your classroom is not important, but there is a shift, 2% every year, that demands you pay attention to things outside of the classroom. And as you do so, you will be a better instructor. How you do that? 
I don't know. Teachers will need to expand their ability to locate resources online, introduce learners to techniques for self-directed learning, and promote a healthy sense of adventure through risk-taking and goal-setting and Game of Thrones, and I don't know what else. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. It will keep changing. All right, one last note, and then I'll end. I call this an open letter to an American English language teacher. For some of you, this does not apply. Dearest English teachers, please learn another language yourself. Seriously. Love shade. <laughs> That's it. For my final thought, let me just recommend that one of the most powerful things you can do that will constantly update your ability to understand what's happening in the outside world is engaging in the outside world. Now, it may be harder. There may be less resources in French. Right now, I'm trying Korean. Oh my gosh. There are, it's, it's maybe more difficult, but trying to engage and trying to build a language ecosystem for yourself is an extremely powerful thing. That doesn't mean I don't want you to have a classroom as a central part of that. I was just talking with Paul. He's doing Chinese. He has a Chinese class, but it can't be the only thing you're doing. If it is, you're not going to learn that language. And nor can you expect that that's how your students are going to learn English either. Okay, so here are just a few things to think through. I'll give you just a minute to look at those. We don't have time to go over it. But this is what I mean. It is my belief that the language ecosystem is something that every teacher needs to understand. This idea that language is learned not through a single textbook or a teacher, but it is a multi-tiered attack. Now, again, what does that mean? How many pieces? What should you be learning? Well, that's why self-directed learning comes in. Right? That's why you need to train students not only with the curriculum yourself, but they need to be given the tools to understand how to build their own curriculums. Okay, so that or curricula, should I say, for those of you here. So that is the time that I have here. Let me just conclude. Please feel free to bug me at sydixon at asu.edu, especially if you want some resources about learning another language yourself. I may have a few. Thank you so much.